We were in bunk beds getting stung by mosquitoes a week ago and now we're sat in the palace with a king eating wagyu. Every minute that goes by is non-refundable. You have to use the minutes wisely. You know, you see John Wick, some people think it's fake. This shit was real. Like the stuff that he had us doing, the most maddest experience I've ever been through in my life. People said, are you mad? Like my dad and everyone else, like you're wasting your time and your money and you're in debt for these dogs. I had a dream and a vision and I said I will grind all the way through until the end. I believe if you can read a dog very well, you've got an ability to read a human. How many people do you think are willing to leave everything behind in order to pursue their greatest self? We're going to sell dogs all over the world. That's why we're going to be called Protection Dogs Worldwide. I'm going to get dogs in every country in the world. I tell you now, there's a lot of people go away and go, this isn't for us, it's terrible. That's because I have a standard in which I will never negotiate. When you have a dog and all the dog wants is you, you're everything to that dog. A dog is a very small part of someone's life, but you're everything to that Dog. Apply some discipline into your life and everything else will change. And we are back with the Frankie Lee podcast. And today, guys, I'm bringing you another first on the podcast. This one I've been excited to do for such a long time. I've been waiting to get this man in for like literally two years now. Lador, Protection Dogs Worldwide. Mate, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited. Mate, are you hyped? Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm excited. Always nervous because we used to film our own stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, it's cool. I'm looking forward to it. Mate, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm happy to have you here. One, because you've, you've literally gone from like zero in a field a few years ago, 15 years ago, training yeah. a dog on your own to now having two facilities, sending protection dogs worldwide, turning over millions of pounds. I think it's a great example for my audience so they can see someone who's took a passion, a side project, and turned it into something really tangible, something that can, they can actually take forward in their life. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why, more than anything, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. Um, so that people understand there is possibility, there is opportunity if you just grind. Yeah. And... It started with nothing. I don't have any education. So I left school very early. So it was one of them things where once I've done well, then I want to show people. I don't want to talk about doing well when you're not doing well. Because like... What, what is doing well to you? <laughs> okay, so define doing well. Whether it's money or whether it's happiness, two different things. Doing well is being happy. That's number one. Right. So you've got to be happy in what you're doing. I do what I love. I train dogs. And that's what I absolutely love. So that's doing well in life anyway. If you're making good money... That's even better. Okay, doing well for me is one, doing what I love and two, being financially free. So I can pretty much do what I want within my means, which I'm happy with. That's financial freedom. Whether it's worth, whether you're worth a million or 10 million or a billion, if you can do what you want and what's living within your means and what you're happy with, that's doing well. I mean, from the outside looking in and from what I know from behind the scenes from my friends that are also friends of you, Jay and Kayla, um, just seeing the type of people you're working with and the stories that we're going to go over on this <laughs> podcast is going to be phenomenal, I, I tell you. But yeah. seeing you, you know, start in that field, just living your kind of dream, your passion, you're just training a dog. Like, what, what was it about training dogs in those initial stages that kind of captivated you? It, it had nothing to do with really training dogs. This didn't start off as training dogs. This started off as, I had a bad car accident. So right. I was a life support machine. I broke my back. I was young, I was driving stupid, drove off a small cliff, and I finished up on a life support. I was in a bad way. When you laid there in hospital, and you know, you laid there genuinely, am I going to walk? Can I do what I want to do? Can I even, what am I going to do in my life? You really lay there and you think, what's, what, what's my purpose? What do I actually enjoy? And I've always loved animals. I've had dogs since I was a baby, since as far back as I can remember. So it was never about money. I wanted to start rescuing dogs. And that's what I started with. I started rescuing aggressive dogs. And that's all it was about. My addiction and obsession became, I need to save as many dogs as possible. I need to work with dogs. I need to save them. And through that, I started to learn how to train, modify behaviors, help dogs. And that escalated into, oh, I can train dogs to do this. Oh, I can train dogs to do that. Oh, this dog's aggressive. It's no longer aggressive. Hang on a minute. I can turn this dog on to be aggressive and then not to be aggressive. It's a protection dog. And that's what led me into the world of checking all these things out. Oh, it's such a thing. There's an actual thing. There's protection dogs out there. People do it. And then the obsession just went from there. I suppose we all have these different things that pique our interest. But yeah. what was it that's, that really, truly piqued your interest about saving the dogs specifically? A dog is loyal. A dog doesn't care what you have. And I realized at the time I had nothing. Okay, I had no money and nothing to offer. So when you have a dog and all the dog wants is you, you're everything to that dog. Remember, like, 
A dog is a very small part of someone's life, might be there for 10 years, but you're everything to that dog for the time that he's here or she's here. So when you're with that dog, they're over the moon, they love you, they love every minute of it, they'd spend every moment of the day with you if they could. That loyalty and love there is priceless. You know, I get goosebumps thinking about it because yeah. it's, it's something that yeah. you can't buy. That loyalty and love and that passion, that dog wants to be with you more than anything. That's the most amazing feeling in the world. When I hear you talk about what dogs mean to you is yeah. similar to how I felt when I found podcasting and when I started to put out content yeah. and stuff like that. You know, you get lit up by it. I you, still I get goosebumps. Look, I yeah. got goosebumps. I'm not, it's nothing I say is like for anything. I don't care about cameras and stuff. I, I say how I feel always. It, it's great because a lot. I want a lot of people to, to feel what you're saying right now. Yeah. Not just listen to it, but feel it. Because at the end of the day, you're a man that's gone out there and just done everything by feel rather than, you know, reverse engineering revenue numbers. Yeah. You've not gone, okay, I can sell a dog for 300k, so I need to sell five a year. You've not done that. You've gone, do you know what? I, I just want to give these aggressive dogs yeah. a second chance. That's all it was. And, and figure out their behavior patterns. All it was, saving. So when you come to figuring out a dog's psychology yep. is, is it a similar type of psychology to a human i believe if you can read a dog very well you, you've got an ability to read a human well you read it bod and uh, look dogs are body language experts a dog can't understand what you're saying people think dogs speak your language but they're not they're listening to your tone they're watching your mannerisms people always say how does my dog know it's often a lead if i just walk to the cupboard and i don't say anything it's reading the language of you walk into the cupboard to get the lead which you always get to take them on a walk so they get excited so they're always reading you. When working with dogs, you read the behaviours. It's our job as humans to look at that dog and go, okay, how's it feeling? What's its mood? What's its temperament? What's going through its head? So when you start reading the dog and the psychology of it, then you can start working out what works, doesn't work, the problems and everything else. Rescuing is different because you don't know the history. So you're trying to work out what's going on with the dog. What we do now, we know the history. So it's very different. But trying to work out what a dog's been through is difficult. Yeah, and, uh, do you remember the first dog you, you took on? I remember the first dog I walked when I went to the rescue centre and it was a Jack Russell cross with a staff or something crazy. And it was in there because it pulled on the lead. Usual stuff, pulled on the lead and if you give it a tug on the lead, it'd turn around, bite the lead and look aggressive. Yeah. It had, had a week before it was going to be put down. And I was like, why? Like, why? Someone must be able to work with this dog. And it was just a real sad case because it was just wanted to walk. And it wanted, to, it wanted to be out there, and it was contained in a kennel. And all it wanted to do was be out and, you know, play ball. After playing ball with it and just giving it some love and doing stuff with it, all of a sudden, it wasn't doing the things it was doing anymore. It was mentally stimulated. It was happier. And I soon realized that you can correct and modify behaviors just through stimulating dogs. Do you think you can correct and modify human behavior in the same way that you can dogs? <sighs> I'd love to think. I try. I try, I try motivate people, I try help people, I try show them the light and certain things. I really get a big kick out of seeing people do well, genuinely. Like if I see someone transform their life, it's as good as seeing a dog transform its life because I get the same feeling out of it. But they don't give you the same loyalty. They don't give you the same love and respect. Yeah. There's always something, I think, that can manipulate a human when a dog doesn't care. How many homeless people do you see with dogs and that dog doesn't leave them? Yeah. They're in the street, could go anywhere, stays under the sleeping bag with them. It, it, it was powerful when you said before about how you felt that you had nothing at that time. Yeah. And that the, the dog was the only thing that you had to, to build a footing off. The only so, thing. So what, why did you feel alone at that point in time when you'd, when you'd obviously gone through that surgery, yep. you're laying on that bed... Obviously, you, have, you, you probably had family around. Or this I had nothing around. That's the thing. I've lived on my own since I was just turned 15. So my family moved abroad when I was young, really young. And, I've and, just, and just left you here? I went with. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. The place wasn't for me. That I've always been a big believer of surrounding yourself with good people. And my family haven't achieved much, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, my sisters are very different to me. And I love them, the family. But not where I wanted to be in my life. So I very much understood that early on. And... I lived on my own since I was 15. You know, I lived from friend to friend and so on. So I've been on my own since I was young. I brought myself up. When you, when obviously, there's a lot of people that listen to this that will have a family that is far from ideal. Yep. But they want to go out there and they want to achieve the world. Yep. And they feel capped by what their family is achieving and what their family is doing and they sure. feel constrained. See it all the what, time. What would your advice be to them? Your family is your family and you can love them endlessly. But 
you have to go on your own path. You have to accept. If that's not what you want, then look at what you want. See the people. You, you watch what people do and you think, that's what I want to do. And it doesn't matter what the family say. Because the time when I was doing dogs early on, everyone was saying, what are you doing this for? What are you doing with dogs? Like, oh, you, you, you've got no money. Like, what are you doing with your life? And even when we started building the business, and it was still doing no good. Only until like a few years ago, it started doing better, really good. But like, even during the build-up, we're behind. I'm living with like next to nothing. The dogs have got heating, but I haven't. You know, you're sleeping in warm clothes because you're freezing because the dogs have got the heating and you can't afford to put it on. And people said, are you mad? Like my dad and everyone else, like you're wasting your time and your money and you're in debt for these dogs. I had a vision. I had a dream and a vision. And I said, I will grind all the way through until the end. Talk to me about this dream and this vision that you had in your head at that time. When I saw the light, I saw that, not only dog training was what I wanted to do. I knew that. After I started at the beginning, I knew this was me. No matter what. I've always had a business brain, okay? I've always been motivated. They're motivated, and then there's dreams and ambition. And I've always had all them things. I understood really quick, when I first, uh, my first money, first bit of money, started doing work with dogs. Someone saw me in a park. Oh, what are you doing with that dog? Doing some training, trying to stop it from being put down. Oh, nice. Can you help me with my dog? Yeah, I'll help you your dog. Cool, no problem. What do you need? Oh, it does this. Helped her. Great. She gave me a £5 note. I was like, I don't, no, I don't need any money. She goes, yeah, I'll give you a £5 note. I've been paying a dog trainer. I said, really? She goes, yeah, I see him every week. I pay him 20 quid for an hour. And that was that. I was like, £20 an hour? I said, this is, this is brilliant. You know, I could do this. I could, I'd do 20 hours a day. I'm going to make good money. And that's when it clicked in my head that I can actually make money from dog training. Not to what I'm doing now. This is a totally different ball game. But that's what started the, the light bulb. But it allowed you to understand in that moment that someone would swap your skills for, for their money and yeah. you could actually make a viable living and put the heating on and, and take yourself effectively Definitely. out of poverty yeah. towards what you wanted to do. Definitely. And it's, it's a rewarding feeling because when you're getting paid, that's, what, that's one part of it. But you're actually changing someone's life because they're having problems with the dogs that ruin the day-to-day life. Oh, I can't walk my dog, or this dog can't go there, or that dog can't yeah. go there. You're actually changing the dog's life as well because the dog becomes more stable and more happy and an understanding of what's going on in life. Because a lot of these dogs don't really understand why they're doing it. Like, they've got no structure. They've got no pack leader. And when they do have, they become happy. Isn't it funny how the same thing that causes a dog to go off the rails is the same thing that causes a human to go off the rails? Of when you talk about a lack of structure in your life, Definitely. you know, you, this vision... This vision, when you got off that hospital bed and then you yeah. started working with these dogs, this vision is ultimately, seems to me, what kind of kept your apex type thing. I literally put my head down. I left where I was living in Leeds. I came up towards this way and I never looked back. I left everything behind my whole life. I just came up here and I went, that is all I'm going to do. And I'm going to grind and grind and grind. And that was all I did. How many people do you think are willing to leave everything behind in order to pursue their greatest self? Everyone's scared. Most people are scared. You've got a 1% maybe in the world that are willing to do that. Everyone's too yeah. bothered about, like, everyone wants a plan B. A plan B. I had no plan B. Plan A was going to be, this is it, yeah. and I'm executing it no matter what. And this is all I'm doing. There is nothing else I'm doing other than this. When I started this podcast, I said to myself I was on a 10-year path. Yeah. Right, from day one. To keep myself accountable. Of course, yeah. Is that something similar that you implemented at the beginning, no. I was day-to-day, month-to-month, you know, just trying to live life, trying to survive the day, survive the month, trying to keep the dogs as good as possible. And I had a vision. There was a small light, really small light, you know, and then it just got to a point where I started going, okay, where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in five years? And all I wanted was a house. I just wanted a house, but a better life for the dogs. It was always about them. It wasn't, I want an incredible house. It was, I want an incredible kennels. I want an incredible facility. I want the place of a dream where the dogs would absolutely love it. I really want people to pick up on what you've just actually said there because what you've actually said is that it was always about something more than me. Yeah. And when you make something like a podcast or like what you're doing about something more than yourself, you'll often find that even though it will take a long time to get to the destination that you think you want to even get to, probably twice as long as you envision at the start, yeah. when you get there, you can't, it, it's fulfilling because yeah. it, was all, it was all predetermined on the fact that you can add value to other people, you can add value to more dogs, that fulfills your heart. Yeah. Yes, you make money out of it, but it's for the right reason. 
What you've said there is exactly right. So my big, if you're talking about my whole, the bigger picture, what is the bigger picture? Why you stop rescuing? People say, why have you stopped rescuing? Why did you stop doing as much as you did? I understand I need to get to a certain position to help more. And I can't do what I want to do if I'm constantly doing small jobs. So my big, the big picture, the end result, what is it? Yeah. I had all the money in the world, what would you do with it? I'd set up the best rescue you've ever seen in your life. I would have the best rescue facility in the world categorically, run and paid for by me. No charity, no nothing. And that would fulfill my life. Where do you envisage that being located? America. Yeah. Yeah. Whereabouts specifically? I don't know. You know, I've traveled America and I love it. There's certain places like Miami, Vegas. I did love LA, but, you know, I think there's other places that are better for what we want. Yeah. Ultimately, it's not about the best area. It's the best area for the dogs. You're looking yeah. at the climate. You're looking at land. The more land you've got, the I don't more think possibilities. You can look, look past Miami then because it's an unbelievable place. I, Everyone I mean, says so. I I'm going next week, so I'm I, excited again. I, I, think, I think the place captivated me when I was there. Like The, the opportunity. Captivate me. Yeah. The opportunity, what you yeah. just said. Walk into a supermarket, people are happy. People are interested. Like, you walk around here in your uniform for protection dogs, no one says a thing. No one yeah. looks at you, everyone looks at you weird. We got stopped a hundred times a day in America. What do you guys do? You know, yeah. the atmosphere, the energy, the people, the vibe is just electrifying. The key thing I've seen in Dubai yeah. and in America, similar type, obviously different type of cultures, sure. but similar type of mentality where just because you're doing well they'll yeah. help you try and do better and want to see you win yeah whereas there's no there's no crabs in the bucket like i've previous i've previously seen like crabs in the bucket in australia trying to pull you down mm-hmm. crabs in the bucket in the uk trying to pull you All down the world but i've not seen it so much tall poppy syndrome in america or in yeah. a dubai so it's i i, I kind of think that you have to um be willing to align yourself with a location that reflects where you want to go as well definitely and it's also people you are what you surround yourself with you know since i've started being around the customers that we've got my life changed dramatically. Every customer I've got has helped me get to the position that we're in. It's a fact. But how do you go from, obviously, a small facility in yep. your house, looking after these dogs, rehoming these dogs, yep. schooling these dogs, essentially, and, getting, and selling locally? Yep. But then, obviously, now you're selling to billionaires. You're selling yep. to royal families. You're selling to all these different aristocratical people that are worth hundreds of billions, some of these yep. people, trillions. Like, How do you go from the level you're working at to breakthrough into that multi-millionaire billionaire status I said, don't think i don't sit there and look at it myself i sit down at night time and i look back and i go if i tell someone these stories they'll think i'm mad they'll think i'm full of, sh- full of rubbish you know are you really are you serious is this guy crazy like i sit there and go i can't even believe what's just come out of my mouth but like <laughs> tell, 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 tell me the first tell me the first story that broke you through though because you might you must okay, I'll you, tell you the break let's yeah. skip a few years let's skip the grind for five six years of making nothing yeah. freezing cold in a field and everything yeah. else moving up here and just surviving split with the partners I was working with over 10 years ago realized that I'm on a different path to him and I wanted to be successful and I wanted to make this everything and he was here for something to do so it was me my partner at the time and she was eight months pregnant, and it was just me and her, no staff, okay? She's out cleaning with me every day, working with me every day, walking dogs every day. This is eight months, eight and a half months pregnant, the two of us. And we were just grinding and grinding and grinding. And we're looking now and we're saying, we're in a bad situation here now because there's no sales coming in. It's really, it's the bank accounts at sub-zero, the heating staying on, you're getting funny with me for not having the heating on in the house and having it on in the kennels. It's coming to a point now where I'm becoming selfish for the dogs and not my partner who's eight and a half months pregnant. And I was like, this is getting unfair. Like, what do we do? And we're sitting around one day and we get a call. And the call's from, it's from Nigeria. And talking about dogs. Now, I was willing at anything, any, anything at this point, any sale or anything that come through, I was over the moon with. I was like, we need this sale. And these people wrote me from Nigeria, said they've seen us, they've just been to America looking at dogs, and they want to come see us. So me being me, I said, yeah, I'd absolutely love that. They actually turned up, and I thought it was a joke. I thought it wasn't going to happen. They turned up, they saw some dogs, I only had four dogs at the time, they saw two shepherds, loved them, left, said they'll have them. So before the phone call, I threw a mad figure out there, not expecting to get it because I thought it was a joke. And I just said the dogs are 20 grand each. Thinking nothing of it. 
He said, yeah, fine. So I thought, it's just a joke. It wasn't real. So I was like, it doesn't matter. When they left, they paid us 40 grand for two dogs. Before they even left this facility? Done. And I thought, I looked at my account. I've never seen 40 grand in my life, okay? It had, well, minus what we were, it had about 30-something grand in. And I was like, we've got 30 grand in, in the account. All that went through my head was, I can keep the heating on and feed these dogs and get a couple more dogs to survive a bit longer. And that's what started us off. But that was essentially the paradigm shift in your head. That was definitely the, oh my God, we've sold a dog for 20 grand. That was like, oh my God. Because I suppose at that point in the UK, you were thinking that, you know, the highest priced dogs you were probably seeing was two or three. Two or three grand, four grand, five grand. And when you start looking into it, it's the time and effort. What costs money is the time. You're putting so many hours in and then the quality of the breeding. Then you look into genetics and then this is how it starts getting more expensive because as you get older and you progress and you understand the business more, you understand what makes a dog more valuable. You were showing me some of the, some of the dogs that were for a sale around the world at yeah. the moment before this podcast. And you're breaking down to me about, you know, the dog's this much, it's this, it's this many years old, it's yeah. got this much going on, it's got this many bloodline. It's got this genetics, it's got this pedigree. I'm, I'm like uh, completely blown away by yeah. the level of detail you're going into. And I'm like, oh, so it's good then. And you're like, nah, it's shit. Yeah. And I'm like, it's shit, but it's 45 grand, bro. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but that's, that's a shit dog. So, what, so what's a good one? And then you show me another one and it's like 350K. And I'm like, what's, so what, what, you know, these variations of difference that we're talking about here, like how does all this work? Well, this is a mad industry. I'm not going to lie. This is a very mad industry. When I started doing this industry, there was a couple of people doing it in England. A couple of people that have been doing it 20, 30 years. I used to look up to these people and think, okay, these guys have absolutely smashed it. And then I soon realized that they're not actually smashing it. They're just charging a lot for something that's not great because I was achieving more. My dogs were so much better. And that's not being big headed. That's just literally going, I watch what you do and I'm going to perfect that even better. Yeah. And that's what I did. I become obsessed. I got this dog. I go, I'm going to beat everything that you do. Everything that you do, I'm going to do it better. And that was me. That was my mentality. So I was like, so why is he selling dog for 20 grand and I'm not? So I understood that if I do better than that, it's worth more. So it's, everything's about engineering and I call engineering training. The more you put into the engineering, the better the dog. The more hours and stuff you put into that dog, the more value it has as such. But anyone can turn up, you can say I'm a dog trainer today. I'm going to go away, set up Protection Dogs UK, whatever you want to set up. I'm a dog trainer. There's... No actual recognized body that means anything here. All the people with psychology degrees and masters in dog training, half of them can't train dogs. I've had them all at the kennels. I've gone through hundreds of people that tell me they've got all these mega degrees in training dogs, but yet are absolutely shit at training dogs. Like for me, you're either good or not good at training dogs. So the process for training a dog, like that, that, I mean, I know we talk, I want to talk specifically about protection dog. A dog that's going to be protecting a high uh, a high value target yep. something like that what are we talking here what's the okay tra- let's start with the process the process is genetics okay you need good genetics that's number one without good genetics does genetics just come down to breed? breeding of course right. it's down to breeding it's and there's a lot of history behind the breeding why it's good that's number one you're still not guaranteed anything with good genetics you just guarantee that you've got well, you're not guaranteed but you've got a good possibility that you have a good ability after that it's what you do It's the energy and the time and effort and the engineering behind developing that dog to get to a position. The next stage of that is understanding the client. If you do not understand your client, you will never get what they want. Understanding the level of threat, what they're after, the lifestyle, trying to mimic the lifestyle, everything about that client, you need to dive into their life to understand them. And this is a pivotal part I want to dive into with you sure. because this, this comes to everyone's business that listens to this podcast yeah. or anyone that wants to have a business. You said the key there is understanding the client. 100%. What are the processes that you put in place right yeah. now in your business to best understand your client? Everything we do is a process. We don't, you ring me today for a dog, forget talking about dogs. We're not talking about dogs today. They're like, what? I want to know who you are. What do you want? What are your fears? What's happened? What's your lifestyle? Are you ringing me to prevent something from happening because you've got a fear? Or has something already happened? Life is about lay- layering the protection. Everyone wants to put protection in place, but it isn't just a dog is one layer of protection. Cameras are another layer. Alarms are another layer. So we dive into the life of 
how many layers of protection do you need? How many do you want? And what's already happened? Have you been robbed? Have you been tied up? Have you been kidnapped? All these things that I get calls every day. Have you been, your whole family been tied up and kidnapped? Have you been taken away? What is the problem? Then we understand the level of threat that they are. Then you can start working out the right dog, what you need, the things that you need to plan out, everything from that moment onwards. How do you differentiate what yep. people think they want from yep. what they actually want? Because in, in, my, in my, all my time of sales and yep. everything I've done, I listen to what people say and they tell me they want something. And, yep. and inherently, I ask certain questions yep. that unlock what they actually truly want. What is the question that you ask your clients to unlock the truth and not this distruth they tell you? Everyone sees a video of a dog and wants that dog. They go, wow, that's the best dog I've ever seen. I've seen a Mali doing all these tricks and performing. It's okay. I ask them questions. I reverse psychology. Okay, do you run 15 miles a day? Are you going to spend two, three hours a day training the dog? Oh, no, I'm not going to do any of that. Okay, well, you've got the wrong dog then. You've picked the wrong dog. What do you mean? Everything that you've just asked for, this is the wrong dog. I put this dog with you. You're going to fail. The dog's going to fail. We all fail. So it's educating them on what they actually need. Everyone wants this, but you have to understand that a dog... A shepherd is not just a shepherd, a Mali is not just a Mali. We're like humans. There's temperaments within every breed that fit somebody. I might have a shepherd today that will fit you perfectly, but will not fit somebody else. So it's understanding my temperament and my dogs and then understanding them. So when you're selling high-priced items in, or high-priced high priced inventory the way that yeah. you are, yeah. we're talking about an animal at the moment, but we could be talking about something else that someone sells in their business. Yeah. The best way that you've found to do it then is to obviously make the customer apply to you to do it. Definitely, yeah. Then you can't just buy a dog from us. It's a process. And this is what a lot of people think they can just come purchase a dog and buy one. I'll knock so many people back. If I think the headache or the dog's going to be in a situation where it's going to fail, I'll say no. And people don't like that. But I won't put my dog in a position where it's going to fail or they're going to fail. And that ultimately allows you to charge more money because you can, you can pick and choose your clients now. I, I do. I really do. Like, we knock back so many people every week. It's just very common. And some people won't, but I do. After you sold those dogs to Nigeria and, yep. you, and they got out there and they're working and they're working well yep. within those families in Africa, yep. what was the next, like, pivotal point that came along there? Because I, I presume they opened up a network to you. Not really. It opened up a network to my own head. We sold dogs locally. Two grand, three grand, five grand maximum we were losing money weren't making any money you don't sell a dog whoever sells a dog for five grand is losing money if they put time in you can't spend a year with a dog and sell it for five grand cost you more than that in food you're not making any money but when all of a sudden i go i've just sold the dog abroad i've never been to africa i've actually sold the dog abroad like the dog's gone abroad how can i sell a dog from england to you know africa hang on a minute i must be able to sell them everywhere surely i must be able to sell them everywhere you know had that ambition protection dogs worldwide you know what I mean? That's when the name came around. At the time, I was still operating under another company, you know, still with my old partners. At that time, that's why I said, that's why we're going to be called Protection Dogs Worldwide, because we're going to sell dogs all over the world. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to get dogs in every country in the world. And how many countries have you hit now? I've so hit like... a lot of the world. Yeah? I've done some mileage. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've hit a lot of countries. What is the wildest place you've ever put a dog into that you never thought you'd do? <sighs> I've sat with kings in places that I can't... I've, I've been in Estonia... In a bunk bed, and yeah. a week later, I've been sat around the table in the palace with a king eating wagyu. It is that extreme, and I've sat there and told people that story. I've gone from there to there, flying private to here and there, and I've sat there and gone, have you noticed what's just happened? Like, we were in bunk beds getting stung by mosquitoes a week ago, and now we're sat in the palace with a king eating wagyu. And people go, what? Can, can we say which province these can't kings say, are in? Can't say the king. Certain yeah. things, look, if I, some of the NDAs I've signed are mental. And yeah. the people you can't mention, but the stories are okay. But like, I sit back and think, what have I just walked into here? Give me one of the wildest stories that you can tell me about, <laughs> about, about this game, because I know yeah, how, how long I, have you got? I, 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 know, I know how many stories are in your locker and I, I want the audience to hear some of the stuff that you've been through. <sighs> okay, well, let's go back a while. Let's go back quite a while. One of the, I thought it was a joke. I thought the whole thing was a joke. Now I'm getting a call, unknown number. Don't like unknown numbers because why are you hiding your number? But sometimes it's a celebrity or a PA for a celebrity. Yeah. So beggars can't be choosers. We're not doing great. I'm going to take the call. I take the call. Russian accent, strong Russian accent. Talking seven, eight years ago. Okay. Hello, you have passed security checks. 
Uh, I ain't applied for nothing. There is no security. <laughs> there's no security checks. Not interested. Put the phone down. Get a call straight back. No, no, you have passed all our security. Blah blah. Starts talking to me about. It. I said I haven't applied for nothing. Like, what are you talking about? No, no, we want dog. What? I thought it was insurance or something. You know, like if someone's applied. <laughs> I thought, someone's applied for something in my name. I don't pass nothing. I haven't yeah. applied for nothing. No, no, we want dog. I said, eh, you want dog? Yes, my client want dog. So I said, I don't get what you want about security. Then, like, he says, yes, we check you. You will pass. So I get it now. Oh, hang on, it's all clicked in my head now. I've gone from being quite. Leave me alone to, oh, sorry. Now he's telling me about I've passed his security checks. So he's obviously background checked me, done a check on us, liked what he's seen, and said he wants dogs. I said, all right, cool. What, what do you want? He says, four of your best dogs. I want to see them. Okay. I said, what's your name? No give name. This is for my client. I said, okay, are you coming to us? No, you come here. I said, where are you? He said, London. I said, all right, cool, I can do London. Where do I go in London? He said, I will give you a dress on day. Okay, what day? What day do you want? Gives me the day, long and short of it. He says, get your four best dogs. So I get, it's a funny story, right? And I don't tell many people this story, okay? But it's gone by so many years. Now, I ain't got four best dogs in at this time. I've got three good dogs and one dog that's a bit cuckoo, right? <laughs> and when I say cuckoo, it's fully cuckoo, right? It's got cross eyes. It's a bit doolally. It's on the edge, right? It's one of them dogs. But I said, I've got three. He says, no, bring four. I said, well, I'll chuck him in for the crack, right? <laughs> They'll see him and go, the other ones are great. Okay, so I'm thinking, great. And I've got three great dogs that I'm taking with me. On the day, I set off. I said, where am I setting off to? He said, set off to this area in London. I said, well, have you got an address? He said, no, set off to the area and send me your live location. Okay, now I think, is this a setup? Like, what, what's going on here? Is this like a joke? It doesn't yeah. matter, you've got four dogs. Listen, I've got four dogs and I've got no money, so I'm going up there. Do you know, I'm going to drive there and I'm going to take the chance. If it costs me 100 quid in fuel on a day, it is what it is. But you've got to be there, haven't you? You've got to try. Drive to London with these four dogs, right? I get to this location. I said, I'm at the location you've sent me. What now? He said, okay, follow me. He pulls up in a car and says, follow me. Now I'm following him. Now I'm not good with this, like, areas. I'm terrible. But he's took me around the block 10 times. And I've realized I'm going around the same block 10 times. Now I'm thinking, this is a proper wind-up. I get to the gates. Finally, he comes out to the window. He says, look, you do not get out the vehicle until we come and get you out the vehicle. So they start checking my vehicles for bombs. Scanning under my vehicle, scanning round, check us, ask us to get out, search us, tell us to get back in, and tell us to wait on the drive. I said, okay. I'm looking at, I'm with Lewis at the time when Apollo I work with. What the fuck, what's going on here? What is going on here? Is this like a joke? Like, we're at this mega house in London, full of security. I'm looking around. There is security everywhere. And I'm talking, everywhere you look, there is a guard stood there with no smile on their face. And I'm thinking, this is a weird setup. This, this is a joke. They're going to come running out with cameras, and it's a big, like, oh, you know. I didn't know what it was. Comes back to the window, says, okay, listen very carefully. Now, this guy had a strong Russian accent and looked hard as I thought, okay. He says to me, boss is coming out now. I said, right. You call him boss. I said, yeah. No sudden movement towards the boss. You don't put your hand out. You don't do anything stupid. You only spoke when you've spoken to, and this is it. I said, okay. He'll ask you to bring the dogs out. You bring them out one by one, and he makes decision. Okay, cool. I'm thinking, what is going on? So I'm thinking some big, you know, mafia guy is coming out or something. The guy comes out in Ugg slippers, three-quarter lengths and a vest. This old guy, real casual, smiling. Oh, what is this? So he comes out, he puts his hand out, I shake his hand, I go, hey up, boss, <laughs> say hi. He says, oh, bring dog. Okay, so I get the first dog out. First dog's called Blade, beautiful. Best looking shepherd I've had in a long time. Bring him out, I think this is game on, this is the dog he's going to have. He looks around the dog like it's a car, right? He goes, looks around the dog. No. I'm thinking, how can you not like this dog? He's beautiful. He's going, no, no, no. I thought, what the fuck? Okay, how can you not like this dog anyway? Okay, cool, we'll get the next one. Next one's called Damon, right? Beautiful dog. So I was looking around the dog. He even touched its tail. I thought, I thought, no, no. Ah, this guy's fucked. I said, this guy's not having anything. He's just a wind-up. You know, I don't know what's going on here. Next dog comes out, Rocky, looks around him, doesn't like him. Well, who have I got left? I've got the fucking cuckoo one, I like Bruce. Four guys, looks terrible. Right, I bring him out, stood there like, no hope now, it's done. He goes, ah, dog? I said, 
Yeah, it's a dog. He says, name? I said, Bruce. He goes, ah, Bruce. Yes, Bruce. I've looked at Lewis and went, mate, is, is he mad? He wants Bruce. He said, yes, Bruce, bye. Shake my hand and has gone off. Security guard says, get back, into the, get back into the van. I said to Lewis, is he mad? Is this cooking? What's going on here? Comes back out 10 minutes later, the security guard says, yeah, he wants, wants Bruce. I said, he wants Bruce? He said, yeah, he wants Bruce. So he said, how much is Bruce? So I said, 40 grand. So I said, it's all a wind up anyway. I just took 40 grand at you. Yeah, <laughs> fuck it, it is what it is. Like, I'm not going to lose anyway. I'm going to drive away with nothing. 40 grand? I went, yeah. Okay, we have two. I went, eh? He said, we want two. I said, two dogs? He said, yeah, two. I said, 80 grand? He said, yes, two. I went, no fucking way. I said to Lewis, they're paying 80 grand for two dogs, Lewis. We need to go back and get a second dog. And long and short of it is, right, when I tell you the scenarios this guy asked me to do when I eventually got talking to him, he wanted me to stage out scenarios of kidnapping him on a yacht, on a helicopter, on a plane. He was asking me what happens if four men walk into the house with AK-47s, how he escapes with them, what he does. And I was like, I have no yacht, I have no boat, and I can't practice. I have, I give you boat, I give you helicopter, I give you plane, you practice. And I can't begin to tell you that year of training with them dogs, what it looked like. It was like something out of a fucking film. You know, you see John Wicks and people think it's fake. This shit was real. Like the stuff that he had us doing was absolutely a lesson for me, but also the most maddest experience I've ever been through in my life. And it just goes to show you that you have to take these certain chances that you don't understand at the time or even chances. Like You don't know it's a chance, but it was just like, unless you're there and you felt what we felt and see the stuff that we've seen with that guy, it was mental. How did you manage to turn around the, the crazy dog into a good dog for him? The dog was good in the work. But it just looked cuckoo. You know, he was a good dog in terms of the work ethic was good. But it wasn't good looking. He was a real ugly dog. Like, there's no questions asked. It is like, it's, some people love that type of stuff. You know, I acquired him. And it's one of them dogs you look at and you go, oh man, he's got nothing to lose. So you probably just like the look of him because he looked like one of the security guards. that had nothing to lose, <laughs> I thought. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe just like the look of him. But it was one of them dogs. Quick one for you guys. This podcast is sponsored by contentremover.com. As many of you are probably aware, I set up contentremoval.com in 2017 to help people remove all forms of online content. And I've looked after some of the biggest names and brands in the world doing it. And I would love to help you if you're struggling. If you're struggling to remove images, videos, search results, fake accounts, or anything online, go to contentremoval.com and we'll help you today. And is that one of those pivotal moments as well where you kind of like, Again, paradigm shift. I can charge whatever I like. That for was these the first dogs. billionaire, right? I didn't even realize who he was at the time until I researched who he was, and then I was like, "Oh my god, you know, this guy is fucking serious. This guy's a big, big fish." And then when you get connected with these people, it, they just connect you into other people and other it's things. Be, you and... become this is the guys you go and get dogs for because you have you sell a dog to someone, it's a sale. But also for us to have a best success, for you to have success with that dog, we need a relationship. I need to be there for you, and I need to be there for the dog. If we work together as a team, you're going to get the best results forever. I'm providing you something that's going into your family. So we have that trust already now. But I'm there for you no matter what with that dog. And if I'm there for you with that dog no matter what, we're friends to a degree. And that's where you have that connection with people. It's just a beautiful business model because you get to do what you love to do, but you also get to integrate with other people's families. And, it's not, and once you sell them a dog, it's not just, it's not just you sell them a dog. It's not a transaction, it's, it's more. It, it, it's, it's you are with that family for 10, 20 years, 30 years then. And repeat buying. Yeah. And then you're with their family because they put you on to other family members yeah. and stuff. And that's when I realized that there is a lot of good people out there because you're around success all day. You're only around successful people all day, every day. I mean, some of the public people that I know that you've sold dogs to yeah. that, that are publicly in the domain are saying yeah. they've bought a dog from you are Kayla Cines, obviously yeah. I know her well. We're both friends with her. Yeah. And obviously you've sold one to Yanni as well from Yanomize. Yeah. Now, give me a bit of a understanding of what it's like to get someone, a, a dog like that, ready for those type of clients. It's, we've got a load of celebrities loads massive we've signed so many ndas for at the beginning when we first got your first celebrity you're like wow i've got this celebrity then they make you sign an nda and you're like what's an nda oh shit i can't tell no one anything i can't even say who i've sold it to i'm like good i've wanted to like it's the most amazing thing i'd never asked for anything off anyone 
I've always been like, I'll just do what I'm doing. If you're willing to help me, willing to help me. If not, cool. I'm always going to help you anyway. I'm going to do what I've said I'm going to do regardless. We did so many football, footballers early on. We've done so many actors, loads of singers. But they were all undercover. We couldn't say anything back then. And then when you can do something with the first person where they say, I don't care, say what you want, we'll do what we want. It's quite nice because you get that recognition for something finally. A lot of people don't want anyone else to know where they got the dog from. It's very secrety, secrety. Oh, I got my dog from these people. I'm not going to say anything. I've got the best and I don't want anyone else to have it. So on the internal business side, it works because friends tell friends and you get sales. Exactly. But on the external where you're trying to grow your social medias and trying exactly. to grow your presence, it doesn't help you, right? It doesn't right? help you at all. And then you've got the promises where you've done favours for footballers and other people that they just don't do what they say they're going to do. People yeah. use you. It yeah. happens. I learned that the hard way. The typical thing where they say, you know, if you help me remove this content, Frankie, I'll post you on social media. Yeah, I've got, I've got nothing. I, I, I've got caught like that many times with early days content removal. And then people still try it now. We've had some big, big names recently over the last couple of years. If you give me a dog for free, I said, listen, I will never give you a dog for free. Understand something now. I I'm not in that position anymore. The psychology of thinking that you can, this is the kind of transaction that can happen for free, it's it just the, baffles me. It just baffles me. It just puts me on a bad turn with you instantly. I understand the marketing value that some people have, but I know a lot of companies do it in England and they give dogs for free. I value what I do way too much and the effort and love I put into the dogs to give anyone one for free. So if you were going to give advice yeah. to this audience on how they can increase their self-worth as to what they do and what they're bringing to the table, what would your advice be? If you don't have value in what you do and you don't believe your own value, then no one else will. You have to value what you do. Even if you've got nothing, you have to have value in what you do. So essentially what you're saying then is for, through your, throughout your whole journey, it's, it's all been your internal dialogue that's taken you to this point. Definitely. So it's that internal conversation. You keep reaffirming that you are worth more, that your dogs are worth 40 grand now. They are worth 300 grand now. All day long. Internal conversation. All the time. I have debates with myself. I know it sounds yeah. mad. People think, are you crackers? I very much, I'm not... I'm not a person that needs motivating. I am motiv I like motivating people. You're internally motivated. Internally motivated. But you need more than motivation in life. Motivation is one thing. You can't be motivated every day. You need discipline. And one thing a dog will give you, if you truly love dogs, if you love this industry, a dog will give you a different level of discipline. If you don't love this industry, you will not have that discipline. Now, what I mean by that is everything that you want to do in your life has to revolve around a dog if you love dogs. When we go for a meal, when we go out, when we do something, when I had my first baby, I had to rush back from the hospital to get my dogs out. On my birthdays, Christmas day, well, it doesn't matter what day it is. I have no understanding of days. A Monday is a Sunday, a Saturday is a Friday. It doesn't care. I don't care. I have to be there for them dogs seven days a week, morning to night. And I always plan care for them or support for them when we're not. So your whole life's around discipline. For them dogs. So you have a non-negotiable on the fact that you're internally motivated for yep. something you're passionate about and you have a non-negotiable for what has to happen as you, most people have a most people have an outs an external thing that they want to achieve. But yep. what you're saying is I'm just going to do the reps yep. and the reps in this case mean that I have to do this for dogs, this for dogs, this for dogs, this for dogs. Yeah. When, if I complete these reps and do these steps, then, I, then the outcome takes care of itself because that's come from my internal motivation. Exactly. Right? exactly. Yeah. Like everything I do is for them. It's a fact. Everything I do is for them dogs because they have done everything for me. Right. Everything I have given for them dogs, they have given me. The house I'm in, the cars I have, the people I've met, everything I have got, I owe to dogs. They've given me it. I'm giving it back. You know, that's how it is. See, I want people to really pick up the internal lessons that you're yeah. dropping here because the internal lessons are the powerful ones. Yeah. What you're saying is if you serve the world, how you're yeah. meant to serve the world, the world will serve you in terms of money, life, abundance, experience. And it has. Yeah. And it has. It's truly given me a life that I could never have dreamt of. Like, I, where the people I've been with, I'm flying on $100 million private jets and stuff. You know, I'm seeing incredible people. I'm with the most amazing people in the world. I'm talking the top 20 and the top 50 of the world. Who would have ever thought... Yeah. You know, a kid from Leeds with no money, with no education, with no nothing, working out of a field with just a dream, would ever be in these places with these things and these people, driving cars that I've dreamt of touching, that I own. You know, like taking pictures of them as they drive past and now being in the cars and looking at your house and going, oh my God, look at this house. I'm in this house. I bought this house. 
Who would have ever dreamt? Like, never in a million years. So I owe all that to dogs. And I know that, and I always am I'm forever grateful to them. And I will, I, I repay them every day with what I can. I do the best I can for them. All the facilities are always built around the dogs. When you look at what we do at the facilities, it's not for me. I don't need a TV in a, in a kennel for a dog. You know, what, what do I need that for? I don't need to have the best flooring down for a dog, but I do. I do everything for them so they can have the best possible life until they go for the forever home. But how you do one thing is how you do everything in your life. That's my life. That's, that's my goal. I'm determined. I've got no negotiables. I do not negotiate the well-being of a dog. That, that is my life. But it's interesting because from the outside looking in, I've, yeah. I'm watching you build this unbelievable business and I just see it as, same, same with the podcast for me, it's, it's such a good networking tool in order to, to meet the people and to, to be in rooms that I'm in and to be in conversations I know you're in. And now, now obviously, you're developing this app. All and, that, and, that, and that's all come through following I'll this purpose. Story. Go, on, go on, tell me. Yeah. Story's mad, okay? Who would have thought I would develop an app, okay? I'm, I'm a dog trainer. I train dogs. I don't do anything to do with apps, okay? This is why if you do well at something and you stick to something and you believe in it and you surround yourself with good people, yeah. honest people, you will finish up around the right circle of people. And when you finish up around the right circle of people, everyone wants to see you do well. And when you're in that circle of people, you can only go one way. Yes. You can only go one way. If you're around people that want to see you fail, you will fail. Get rid of all that stuff out of your life. Go with people that only want to see you do well. And you need to be around successful people. You have to be around successful people. If you can get around them, it's infectious. It's an energy. So... As you progress in the business, you start dealing with billionaires and millionaires and successful people. They have to be to afford these dogs. Went to Australia to sell a dog. Met Kayla and Jay for the first time. When you meet someone good, I believe I'm very good at psychology. Met them within 10 minutes. I knew I'd be friends with them, regardless if I sold them a dog or not, for life. I knew these people were friends for life. Fact. We are only meant to meet for breakfast. Spent every minute of every day with them, lunch, dinner, everything. Coolest people ever. Then looked into it. I don't really research too much on my clients. I like to speak to them as people. I don't care what they have. I'm not interested in what they've owned. I just want to know them as people. That's all I care about. Then I looked into Kayla and I realized she's got an incredible app. She built one of the best fitness apps in the world, probably the best fitness app in the world. I was like, Kayla, I've always wanted to build an app, right? So I built an app at the time because I wanted to, give my dog training skills to other people so they can learn and progress. So long and short of it is I built this app. I didn't build it myself. I paid someone to build it. It was very cheap. Sat around the table with Kayla and Jay and Joe at the time who came with me and it was for breakfast. I said, do you mind looking at something for me? Just cast your eye over this app. It's about to go live. I spent two years building it. Thousands of videos on it. What do you think? She went, oh yeah, I'd love to look at it. I give her my phone and I just see her flicking and going like this. You know what? She doesn't approve of anything. She's got, oh God, oh. I'm thinking, what? She said it's the worst app she's ever seen. <laughs> I said, I thought she was joking. <laughs> I had a sip of my coffee. Well, come on. It's the worst app I've ever seen. She goes, horrendous. She goes, the idea and what you've put on it is genius. But the way you've designed it, developed it, and the look of it is shocking. Don't do it, we'll ruin you. I said, what do you mean? She goes, you'll never do well with this app. I said, so what do I do? She goes, well, I'll help you. I like you. I said, really? She said, yeah, I'll help you. Scrap it. I said, well, scrap the videos. I've spent two years filming. There's, there's about 800 videos on there. Editing, filming, spending all my day. Scrap it. So I took it as a life lesson. I wasn't too proud. I turned around and I said, okay, I'm going to listen to the expert. I'm around good people. She has no reason to lie to me. She only wants to see me do well. I could see that. I could feel that. I'm going to take everything she says on board. And she said, this is how it needs to look. This is how you need to do it. This is what you need to do. And I said to her at the time, I'd love to work with you and Jay. I think you're great. I think you're brilliant people. I'd love to work with you both. And that's how we finished up developing Doggit. And from that conversation at breakfast, Doggit will be a billion dollar app. I'm 100% sure of it. Because the plans and ambition I've got for that app is huge. It's launched. It's gone live. But it's at the very small beginning of where it needs to yeah. be but it just escalated over the next couple of years after that Kayla's key skill is branding yeah, that's it and and 
being able to see what the audience wants and how they want it to look so they can buy it. Her brain works in a crazy way. Yeah. You sit around a table with Kayla and you know yourself, you've sat with her. Her brain works and she reels it off because she has to say it as it's coming. And it works in a mad way, but it works. Well, put, put it this way. I went to dinner with her and bearing in mind, at this point, I've looked after her and her businesses yeah. online for a, for a long, long time at this point. Yeah. I sat down for dinner with her and about a year and a half ago and said to her, you know, are you ready to come on the podcast now? And bearing in mind, I'd done my apprenticeship in podcasting, yeah, yeah. so I'm pretty proficient. I was doing numbers, everything. Yeah. She says no. She said, you need to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, and align the brand this way, and this way, and this way. She says, I'm telling you that because I'm your friend, and yeah. because I want to see you win, and I need you to elevate yourself to be able to, to do this podcast. Yeah. Because like she that. says, she, and she just called me out. She called me out. She says, yeah. this branding's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. You're doing that wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. She handed me. If you ask someone like that an opinion, and then you get offended by it, yeah without taking it and implementing it. It was only by me going and implementing it and you got, by you not being too proud and implementing yeah. it that you are now sat there with an app that's going to be worth X amount of money. Exactly. And, and I'm sat there ha- having had her as a guest and, yeah. all, and, and unlocking the doors that that'll unlock. So it's like you have to be, a, you have to be willing to listen to people that know more about so shit than you. So many people are too proud. So, too many people are too proud. Like in this industry, no one, there's no such thing as a fully trained dog trainer. When you accept that in this industry, you soon realize that there's always something better or someone better or someone doing something better or learning from day-to-day psychology of a dog. Too many people think they're experts straight away. Dogs change. People change. You have to adapt to what the dog is doing. Well, as soon as you think you're the best at any form of art, yeah. you, you're not asking the right questions. You're not learning. You give up on learning. Ew. You give up on learning if you think you're the best at something. You no longer value anyone else's opinion. I... You know, you've just got to be willing to keep reinventing and reinvigorating Definitely. what you do and this and the other. Like, I know for a fact that if I did podcasts in yeah. a studio every week, that they're, that they're better produced than what I'm producing right now in terms of, in terms of you know, consistency basis. Same with dog training, though. Right? right? If, yeah. if I've got the facility, they're better. Yeah. But in order for me to get podcasts like this and to do the podcast that I'm doing, I have to be able to move. Yep. So I have to give away a little bit on the front end sure. to be able to unlock the guests that I can unlock. Definitely. And that is something, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to, to do and go through the motions with. And I'll take the punches on the, on the internet when people say, oh, why is, they'll say on the YouTube comment, why is he holding the mic? Why haven't you got mic stands and all that? Ever? Because they don't understand the psychology yeah. of how long it's took us to get to the point to even do this podcast, yeah. right? People are too, bo- people are always going to pick out the negatives in what you're doing. Then people yeah. are never any good for you anyway. Yeah. Then people are, pick out, why is he holding the okay, Who cares? Look who I'm sat with, look who we're doing, look at the people I'm around all my life. Yeah. I stopped caring five years ago roughly five years ago, what people said about us. Everybody in this dog industry is out there to get us. Yeah. Trust me, it's a hostile industry. Most people want to see you fail. That is the truth. People are too busy consuming their energy on trying to watch someone else fail or make them fail, when really, why don't you put all that time and effort into bettering yourself? Why not compete with yourself? Why not go, you know what, forget what, you, forget what, you, what he's doing. Who cares what he's doing? How about I go spend that time doing something better myself? Collaboration is the, is, is the ultimate key that yeah. unlocks the door. And you've, you've discovered that by not carrying any pride. Um, yeah. You know, not, not so much. You have pride in what you do, but you're not too proud to listen to other people's opinions. On and I'll go meet dog trainers all around the world still. I still go value the time I spend with other dog trainers that are not out there, don't care about social media, that are proper dog people. And I'll go spend time with them and even watch all the things from them and go, that's a great behavior I've just learned. That's amazing. That's incredible. That's good. I'll take that on. When, and, which, when you actually think about it though, yeah. Lee, right, from, from a psychological level, right, when you think about it, you as a dog trainer, yeah. me trying to be a good podcaster yeah, yeah. or as good as I can be, right? Yeah. When you actually think about it, it's mental to think that at any point in your entire life that you know everything about this art. Yeah. Or about yeah. the dog training art. Like it's, it's mental to think that you could, you can't, no one is ever the best at it. Not even Joe Rogan is the best at podcasting. Yep. He's he's proficient and he's as and he's as good as we can see at the moment. But is he the best? No, because there's certain things that potentially that that someone else could teach Joe that he doesn't know yet. Maybe maybe it's rich. Everybody's Roll. like that. You when know, you don't believe you're like that. You've stopped learning. You've you've yeah. give up. I believe you've give up. I learn something every day from a dog or something from someone. I learn bad. I learn 
what not to do. You've got to accept them lessons as well. You'll see someone come in, you'll see a behavior from a person, you go, I learned today, that's not how he should ever be. Mm. You've got to take them lessons on as well. You've got to see other people failing, and if they're failing, you go, that is not what I want to do. That's a lesson. It's a valuable lesson. One of the things that I think a lot of people are doing in their businesses is they have the right idea for what they want to do, but they're potentially framing it with the wrong type of clientele. Yeah. One thing that you've done very well is you've positioned clearly as the top of the market and you've gone to the top of the market straight away. Similar to what I did in content removal, I went straight to the top of the yep. market and that's why I signed big clients. Mm-hmm. I didn't fuck around with Google reviews and trying to piss in the pond that everyone was pissing in, right? Yep. So what is your advice then to anyone listening to this in regards to positioning themselves so they can, so they can get wet when it comes to money? There's only one thing that matters and that's your discipline. Well, I say the only one thing. You have to have a true love for what you're doing. If you are in this industry for money, fame, Instagram reels, or whatever else that is that you're looking for, you're not in the right place. We have gone through hundreds of people that have watched our page, watched our stuff, turned up, think it's all fancy, and think they're not going to have to get stuck in and do all the dirty work, which is 80% of dog training, and then disappear in a week, two weeks, a month, two months. Not many people withstand what I put them through at the kennels. Tell you now, there's a lot of people go away and go, this isn't for us, this is terrible. That's because I have a standard in which I will never negotiate. I will never, ever sacrifice my system for them dogs because you think it's wrong. I'm obsessed with the bit, like the best life for them. If it's raining, we're walking. If it's snowing, we're walking. If it's windy, if there's a storm outside and it's Christmas Day and our feet are hurting, we are walking because that dog doesn't know you're feeling shit. It just wants its walk. Yeah. So I never, ever, ever will take less than what I expect on the dogs. That's number one. So you have a love. The next thing is discipline. Applying the level of discipline anywhere in your life is crucial. Whether it's the gym, whether it's diet, whether it's routine, whether it's making a bed, whether it's walking, if you can't apply a simple discipline to your life, how can you ever be successful? Because you can't stick anything out doesn't matter where the discipline is. You have to have, I can do something for this level of time, regardless of what's going on. I will never stop. I will always do that. That's discipline. That combined with what you love will create success. Yeah. I love the fact that you said that because I think if you just concentrate on the rep yep. rather than the outcome, yeah. that is where the discipline is formed. It's the like, days that you don't want to do it. The dogs don't give you that option. I've had COVID, I've been ill, I've broke my back, I've broke my hand, I've broke bones. Do you think I can sit in bed and go, I can't get out, my, dog, my dog's not going to go out today? I'll limp around the fucking field with the dog. I'll, I'll wheel myself up the street with my dog. You know, we'll, we'll do everything that's possible. Don't care, the dog doesn't care that I'm ill. Got a bad throat, oh, I feel a bit cold. Doesn't matter. The dogs apply discipline to my life like nothing else. Go for a meal. Okay, I'm not drinking. I don't drink. I go back. I've got to get my dog out. Come on, you've got to get the dogs out. I've got to get the dogs out. Oh, it's a joke. It's a common joke between friends now. Mm. I'm in Leeds. I go for food, looking at my time, looking at the time. What are you looking at the time for? It's been three hours. I've got to go. When I tell people I don't drink, yeah. they think I've, I've never had alcohol. Yeah, and yeah. and they, they think I'm crazy. But I try and explain to people, I can't afford to drink because I can't, I can't have the time off to feel shit. To, I, can, I can work. I've got, I've got too much. I've got, I, I already think life's too short or as it is. Like, yeah. I, I, there's so much I want to do. Yeah. And same with you. I know like, when you've got that purpose, that ingrained purpose within you, you can't just fucking go and drink and piss it up and sit in the pub and talk bollocks with people. Like, Whatever you do wrong, you've got to pay for the next day or the same day. Yeah. You've got to pay for it. Regardless, if I, we had a Halloween party here not so long ago, okay? It was the first time I've probably drunk in a while. Do you think I didn't get up in the morning at six and do the dogs? felt shit mm. I took that sacrifice that's a sacrifice I had to do it I, no matter what I'm not going oh I feel rough oh, I'm in bed I feel shit for myself sorry get up fucking work no choice you've got to get up you've got to do it so you take your dedication to the point of view of like same wake up time same bedtime mate we so- got to bed early I got to bed early every night I get into bed early every night I'm strict with the gym I'm strict with certain things I'm strict with like certain health things and food and things like that and I apply discipline everywhere I can in my life the hardest part is balance People always talk about what balance, where's the balance in your life? It's the hardest part. Anyone trying to build a business, if you're too busy working in your business and not working on it, 
It's not going to grow. So finding that balance is hard. I hate sitting in the office. Not that I dislike Jen. I love Jen, who I work with. I cannot sit in the office for more than an hour because I love training dogs. But I know I have to do it every day to, to communicate with Jen, to tell me all the things that are important about what's going on with the business, and then I can go out. don't like doing it. But I have to. I have to find that balance and that time where you work on the business and not in it. Because when you're working in it, you can't work on it. Yeah. And then you're stuck. And what's been the trajectory of the business since you've been applying that time? I think you you convert more sales. You you have more time to think. Mm. I can't sit still for too long without doing something valuable. Met a guy recently who said the phrase to me, which I'll never forget it, which has even has made me think even more about every minute of my day. He said the term non refundable minutes. Every minute that goes by is non-refundable and you have to use their minutes wisely now when he said that to me if you implement that into your head every time you're doing something shit you will start to go oh fuck that I'm not doing that because it's ingrained into my head now that if I'm doing something that has no value why am I doing it so I might do it for I might have done it for 15 minutes before and now three minutes in I'm going what am I doing I've ingrained that into my head that I'm wasting time to do something good. So rather than fucking about doing something stupid, flicking through 100,000 reels a day or sitting there on computers or TV watching something, having no value, use the minutes that you've got to work on your business or yourself. Whether you're in the gym, whether you're eating a nice meal or cooking something or going on a walk or doing something for yourself, if it brings value to your life, use them minutes wisely. And that's what I try to do every day. I try to use it. I go to the gym Five times a week, I walk the dogs every day. I get up every morning. I go to sleep early every night. I don't step outside of that. I do every day. I try to apply more and more discipline and more and more like structure to my life. And you keep this discipline when you're traveling as well? All the time. Every time. The second we travel, ask Jane Kayla. They'll tell you the day I got to Australia, I landed at 6 a.m. after a 32 hour traveling. I went straight to the gym with them. She made a video on it. Yeah. I went straight away training. I went to eat. They took us for a nice meal. I went back to the hotel. I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning. I went to the gym. I was fucked. But I did it because I even got to America. First thing I do is train. I don't go because I want to go at that point. I'm so tired. You're jet lagged out your mind. I go because my mind's telling me not to go. So I have an argument with myself. Fuck off. You are going because you don't want to go. And that's the type of person I am in my head. I have an argument. Internal dialogue. Internal arguments with myself. Because I didn't want to do it, now I have to go do it. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's a bit of weakness there. And I go, I'm not having that. I'm, not having, I'm, not, I'm, I'm having an argument with myself, sitting there having an argument with myself. No way, yeah, you're giving up on that. You go now. I think you're the, you're the best person to ask this because when it comes to getting people in the right habits and helping them break the, the, the yeah. bad habits that they've got, you've, helped, you've had to do that as a human, but you also help dogs break the worst habits in the world yeah. that could potentially end people's lives, essentially. Definitely. So you, and you help them break them habits. So what... If you were going to give the absolute critical, critical advice for someone that's yep. got a toxic habit in their life right now, they've got a yep. toxic habit, it's, it's killing them. They know it's toxic, but they, yep. they just don't feel they can break it. How do they break that habit and then reinvent themselves? You need to do one thing at a time. I've lo- it's, it's almost like dieting. You have a bad diet, and then all of a sudden you go to the gym, you get a diet plan, and people think they're going to stick to it, okay? You look at all these plans, someone's drawn the whole plan out for you. They're asking you to change everything in your life in one day. It's not possible. You have to find one thing that you can stick to. But psychologically, you are then applying discipline to your life. Because if you can do something for 100 days, you can do another thing for 100 days. Before you know it, it becomes normal. Because I've done it for 100 days, it's just the norm. I get up, this is what I do, 100 days in. I can keep doing it. So you apply each day as it comes. But you need to find something small. Make a small change in your life. And you fight with yourself. You have a mental argument with yourself if you're about to do something that you know is bad for you. Argue that. I got through today. Or I went to the gym today. I went to the gym today. I walked today. I walked again today. I walked again tomorrow. And you have each day is a battle until you're no longer arguing with yourself. Until it's just the fucking norm. I get up. This is what I do. And I'm fucking fighting with myself. So when you get to the point then, when that internal battle is no longer your biggest thing yep. that tells you you've mastered that habit and you can now stack another habit in, into your I'll give you a prime example yeah. my best friend okay my best friend since I was a kid like a brother to me yeah didn't have much ambition 
and didn't really do anything. The nicest person you'll ever meet in your life. Loyal, honest, good, loves people, has no bad, just a pure guy, okay? Let himself go in terms of, was obese. But he was happy with life. But I said to him, every time I met him, I said, look, you cannot keep looking like this. You can't look like this. You need to better yourself as a person. You need to do more. I will tell someone the harsh, harsh truths. I have no problem in saying, listen, you are fucking up. These are all the problems. I tell you because I love you. I don't tell you to be nasty. If you see it as nasty, it is what it is. I say it because I love you. Fucking take it. If I'm saying you're fat, it's because you're fucking fat. I'm not, you know, it is that thing. <laughs> it's true though, It's yeah. true. I'm not saying it to be a nasty fucker. This is how you are. You need to sort that shit out. And I'm going to tell you it as it is because I love you. The people around you will think you're okay or feeding you donuts or going for a meal with you because they want a good night. Then people don't care about you. I'm telling you because I love you and I want you to do well. You need to sort your shit out. Okay. All of a sudden, after plugging and plugging and plugging, a transformation in his head. You've never seen anyone transform themselves in three years like him in my life. But what has it done? Forget how he looks. Okay. He's applied a discipline to his life with dieting and training. Not only does he look incredible, what's become of him? Oh, I'm motivated now. Now he's got motivation. Now he wants to apply that discipline in the gym and his diet into business. Yeah. He's had no ambition for 30 odd years. But because he's applied them disciplines, he believes in himself. He's seen self-worth. He looks great. What has he done by that? He's now applying that into his business that we've helped build it with. And now he's like, he's on it on another level. And he'll be super yeah. successful in the next five years. And you become undeniable in, in the belief that you have in yourself and what you're here to do and everything, everything. else. You have a purpose. Yeah. You have a purpose. You apply the discipline. Then next thing you know, you become obsessed. And the word obsessed is very important. You need to be obsessed with whatever you do. Obsessed. You have to live, breathe, and dream it. You have to speak about it. You have to go. I sit there on a night before I go to bed, and I am as, as excited as I am every morning when I have a new idea. I want to get up in the morning and fucking go crazy. I want to go mad with it. When I, when I see you as a man, I see you as a man that's uh, so excited for the uncapped potential in the world of protection dogs, in yep. the world of the, the app that he's building. Someone who's on a mission to build this phenomenal network of people that, you know, just keeps expanding in, in all these realms, you know? I'm so excited. I know it sounds mad. People say, how do you wake up with the fucking energy? It's pissing it down. It's raining. Why are you so excited? I, I am excited. I drive to work. I laugh. I have a laugh. Don't get me wrong. It's raining. It's miserable. Yeah. It's cold. And I start laughing to myself. Now, if anyone has seen me, they'd think I'm crazy. What's his, what's his problem? Is he mad? Like, he needs sectioning. He's crazy. What's he laughing at? Because what do you do? Do you sit there and sulk? Do you sit there and cry that the weather's shit, that you're going to have a rough day? Do you fuck? You sit there and go, I'm going to make the best of this day. This is fucking brilliant because I'm going to finish up in a better place soon. Yeah. This is another day, one day closer to being where I need to be. It's, it, you, you're not even halfway along your mission, essentially. No, it's, I'm scratching the surface. Because, it's what yeah. people say, you've smashed it. Yeah, we, we have. We've done great. I genuinely reset every year. I reset. I go, okay, what did we do last year? Great. I'm starting again. So how are you reviewing the overall year? Just give me, just break that this down. This year? This year is my biggest year. It's going to be the biggest year to, to ever Every day. And this is the year that I always believe at every year. I say that at the beginning of every year. But this year is my biggest ever year. And I've met more billionaires in the last six months than in the last 10 years. I've met more incredible people in the last six months than in the last 10 years. The network's got bigger and bigger. The type of people that we're sitting with is things in films. But good people, great people, amazing people that genuinely want to see you smash it. What are some of the key insights that these billionaires are giving you that millionaires and hundred millionaires aren't telling you? Let me tell you something. This is where discipline applies. I've recently been to see someone who's a billionaire that gets up every morning at six, walks the dogs, goes to the gym, trains, eat well, and carries on and goes straight into work and does that seven days a week. He's a billionaire. Why does he need to do it? Why not sit back and relax? That shows you the level of discipline that these people have. They are where they are because they deserve to be where they are. Yep. Not because of luck. People always say, oh, you're lucky. Fuck, am I unlucky? I've had nothing all my life. You know, I haven't got lucky. You watch me, I'm, if anything, I have bad luck. You know, like I have worked nonstop to get to this position. These people, people, why don't they stop? Because it makes them sane. It makes them happy. It makes them happy being in that mind frame and disciplined. It's not even about the money anymore. 
Forget people. People go, oh, it's about the money. It's not, it's not about making the next billion or the next million. It's about having that battle with yourself to be disciplined, to be going, I'm never going to quit. I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay in my structure. But those billionaires that you speak of, yeah. and I've spoken to quite a number of myself yeah. in my business life and through this podcast journey, they want to help you and give you insights to unlock new levels in More you. More than anybody. Because, because they, they want, they kind of see you like, uh, they just want to mentor you. I can't describe it, Look at but it like they this. just want to mentor I'll tell you. you why. You were a billionaire that can buy anything that they want. I'm talking anything. They want a plane, they go buy a plane, they've got a plane. They want a yacht, they'll go buy a yacht, they want the best house. What's left after that? If you're a good person, you're a good fucking person. Okay? If you want to see someone do well, you will always want to see someone do well. It's who you are. There's more of a kick out of seeing someone else do well than yourself sometimes. I get more of a kick out of seeing someone do really well and successful than sometimes my own successes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, have yeah. a feeling inside where I go, he's fucking made it. Yeah. Because I helped him. Yeah. Or when a dog's made it, when I rescue a dog, in opposed to selling a dog for 50 or 60 grand, the rescuing has more of a feeling to me than the sale. Yeah. I've done something for someone that's made them successful or the dogs finish up successful from nothing. That feeling there, it's not about money anymore. It's about an internal feeling. To see someone else do well and see someone be successful, that's why good people do it. Is there any particular statements or, or just little three or four words that they've given you at certain points in time that has just allowed you to click something in your head? Non-refundable minutes was a big one. You know, positive mental attitude. Guy called Bobby, Bobby Kasher yeah. in America, coolest yeah. guy probably ever met. What a guy, like yeah. infectious energy. Billions in real estate. Cool guy, really cool guy, really good to watch. Infectious. Spoke to me on a Monday morning on FaceTime about dogs. This is how serious the guy is. Spoke to me on a Monday, 48 hours later, flew from Miami to England. How many people do that, okay? This is a serious guy. This is a guy that just says what he wants, does what he wants. When you meet him, I seen myself in him, I see everything he does, I was like, so I'm not the only fucking crazy one. You know, I'm not yeah. the only one that's obsessed. I'm not the only one that's like wanting to see people do well. This guy's cool. And that's an infectious person to be around. What did that do for me? I've already got drive. I've got ambition and I've got motivation and I've got discipline. But it heightened it. So all the things that you've got around the right people, you've got all them things. That's who you are. That's your person. It heightens everything. So the only people essentially dedication and these habits that people think are boring yeah the only people that they look boring to are the, are, people, are the, are not... are the people doing average shit anyway exactly the normal the normal joes the ones that you know are happy with a 30 grand a year and that's their lot and there's nothing wrong with you being at that level or you only wanting that there's nothing Definitely. wrong with that but if you do want that in your life don't go on the internet yeah. and write a comment under someone who's trying to be better that's what kill what kills me is i'm not here to judge anybody if you're happy with that life, who am I to say they're not happy? You know, if they're happier than someone else, then they're successful in their own right. I'm not here to judge or ever judge someone's success. Happiness is success. If you're making a billion and you're unhappy, then you're unsuccessful in my eyes. So I don't judge people based on what they're making. I judge it on based on the happiness. But what frustrates me is people want to do well, but they hang around a certain type of people that are happy being Average. What do you define happiness as? Happiness is, well, it's a, quite, it's, a, it's a deep question. Okay, a deep, deep question. Health is one of the most important things. You can't buy that. You need your health, okay? But happiness is, it doesn't matter what you've got. Doing what you love. Remember, we wake up on a morning and go to work. How many hours of the day do you work? It's the majority of your life. You work, eat, sleep, repeat. So if you're not doing what you're happy, what you, you're, if you're doing something that you're not happy with, that's the majority of your life. So you need to find something that you enjoy. Or I always say to people, well, how do I just do something that I love? Go work at a supermarket, but with a vision of building something in the background to get to where you need to get. Yeah. Don't just go there and be there for a year to pass time. You have to have a vision. If I'm here, I worked at banks, I worked in normal shops, I've worked in normal places. I never wanted to stay there. I knew I wasn't going to stay there. I needed to do what I needed to do to have some money. I've worked markets, I've done everything. I didn't want to be on a market at five o'clock in the morning. Do you know what I mean? But I went there because I needed to survive. But there was always a bigger picture. 
How are you mapping out your your big picture though on, in in the physical? Are you, are you doing vision boards? Are you doing? Is, are you just writing a list of goals at the you start of the you year? You don't want to step into my head. My head's like it charts everywhere in my head. No, I, but are, are they all in your head, or do you bring them in the, into the physical world as so, well? So this is the big thing about like, media and filming and stuff like that. I've created Odyssey, which is a documentary about my life. So I've documented my life. I've documented, I've done like a mini document. Is it to promote anything? No, it was the storyboard. I want the kids, the kids sit down on nighttime in bed and they watch Odysseys. They see where the dad is. They watch it. Oh, dad, you've been to Australia. Oh, you've seen Jay, you've seen Kate. Oh, you went to America. You dropped this dog off. They know where I am. I've got no memories for when I was a kid. I've got nothing from when I was a kid. So you're, d- you're documenting the whole I'm process. documenting the process so that I have something to leave my kids so they can see where I've been. So they know who the dad was. They know what we did. You know, this is how we got to this stage. They see the hard work. They see that commitment. They've got something like, I, my, my kids are structured, like the work. They understand the value of work. They understand that they're coming to work and they have to do this. That's how I'll bring them up. I, I define that as happiness. You know, me being able to give them the life that they deserve. I think the key elements from this podcast that I've learned from you is that the importance of having a purpose beyond yourself, yeah. the importance of structure, the importance of, of having non-negotiables and the importance of understanding that if other people in your life are, are essentially calling you boring or trying to shut you down, you, you need to get that, away from that's, actually, that's actually your key metric for knowing that you're on the right path to self. It is, but you also need to get yourself away from that. That's one of the main things. You have to surround yourself with good people, motivated people that are doing well. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean you need to go find yourself a billionaire today and sit with them. You don't. You just need to find people on the right path. People that have a vision that they know, or even whoever it is. One of the key things I tell people to do is to change their environment because I think changing Definitely. your environment changes your life. Yep. You, you not only changed the environment in the UK to put yourself in a better position so you could concentrate on your dogs and stuff, but what, but what your dogs have allowed you to do is yep. to constantly change your environment. Yep. So like you go into Miami this week, you, you'll, go, you'll be in Saudi Arabia in a month's time, you'll be in Australia another month. Yep. So you're constantly changing your environment through your passion and through your purpose and through everything else. So you've essentially created a flywheel effect with everything. Exactly. And I think that's, that's what I want people to get out of this podcast is yeah. the fact of like, you've been on a lot of these lots of little steps, little steps, little steps. Okay, pivotal moment, little step, little step, yeah. pivotal moment. But you're essentially building a flywheel, building a bigger flywheel, building a bigger flywheel. And that's connecting you with all these other opportunities. That's exactly what it's done. Like people don't understand if you stick to something, it will open doors up. You will find like, who would have thought a built of app with someone who's built one of the best apps in the world? Why? I owe it to who? I owe it to the dogs. I owe it to my structure that what I've done and the discipline yeah. I've applied. And that got me to meet them because they wanted a dog. If it, the dog led to an app, the app leads to property. The app leads to whatever you want it to do. How are you guys promoting the app and getting the app into the world so that it, so that it can be this billion so dollar So Kayla's thing? Kayla, who you already know, she's very structured. She's very like disciplined. Again, a very disciplined person. Neither of them drink. They're both trained. They're both completely structured. Super similar to myself. And that's why we got on so well. Me, her and Jay are like peas in a pod. We got on so good. That's why they're successful in what they do. So the apps took longer to launch because of the pickiness of what it is. I've stepped back and said, cool. I want it to launch. I've been eager. I've been filming nonstop for two years. It's got to the point now where it has launched. A soft launch is a soft launch. I see it as the beginning. People go, the app's amazing. I go, yeah, but I see so much more for this app. I want it to be the biggest dog app in the world where I bring all the trainers, all the good trainers from around the world. Collaboration. Collaborate them and us so they can network themselves so they get the credit they need. Not just us. Not just we benefit from it. They benefit. The people that are putting the hard work in them fields and them sh- and working nonstop, if they have a platform to promote themselves and work themselves and show their skills to the world, this isn't about taking business of anyone. This is about building business for people. Yeah. So you've kind of, you've, the industry, the dog industry, even, if you, even when you're talking about competitive dog, yeah. dog breeding like Crufts and stuff, it's so competitive, everyone hates each other. Yeah. That's the kind of industry we're talking mm-hmm. about here. And what you're saying is let's make it collaborative. Let's, let's make it, yeah, yeah, let's make everyone help each other. Everyone knows you are better as a team. Instead of hating on someone, work with them. Say, why hate on someone? All right, there's people doing stuff wrong. Forget them people. Them people are never going to do good. But why hate? Why not just work together, build a team, help each other, 
If you can put money in his pocket and he can put money in your pocket and you're all helping, what a feeling. What a feeling when you're all helping each other and you're all winning. What is the point in winning on your own? What is the point of me sitting in this barn on my own as, a, say, a multi multi millionaire if I haven't got anyone good around me? What do I do with myself? I noticed when I came in here and some, some of the staff members at work here, they just seem to love what they do because they're, because they're just genuinely love the dogs they love training people yep. they love the facilities they get to do what they're passionate about they get they're flying all around the world they're getting their their, 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 their their whole life is essentially being facilitated it's that's the hardest process of this business and i think anyone who owns a business will understand and value what i'm saying in terms of it's a dark place the reason it's a dark place is because you have got the responsibility i've got 20 people working for us at the at the facility now you are responsible for all of them people the wages, the money, making sure that they could do what they're doing and how everything is. Finding a good team is the hardest thing ever because people have to align in what you're doing. They have to have the love. I'm not saying everyone has the passion or the, the drive that I have, but the love and the care for animals is number one. People become jealous of other people. We take one member of staff abroad with us, the other one believes they should have done it instead of being cheering them on. Cheer them yeah. on. Why don't you work a bit harder to get to where he or she is? Yeah. Why hate on them? You know, why start spreading rumors? And that's what we find difficult, finding a good team. And that's why people say, how come so many people come and go? That's just life. I will not hang on to negative energy. I won't have people around us that are bringing other people down that want, you have to get rid of that out of your life. And so, I've learned that. So you have to hire slowly and cut fast. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard process, but... I'm building a team of winners and everyone around us will win. Everybody around me, I want to win as much as me, if not more than me. I want to see them all smash it. Yeah, That's what I want to see. Because, I mean, some of, the, some of the lads and girls that work here are probably just country people. They wouldn't get to see or wouldn't get the opportunity to see a billionaire's house in Miami on a normal, on a, on a Wednesday afternoon unless they were working for a business like this. And let me explain something. It's like people think you have to have like a really good education to do what we do, or you have to come from a certain background. The people that we have at the kennels, most of them are taught by me. You've got lads that have been window cleaners, gardeners, shop assistants. I want, I'm looking for a type of person. I'm not looking for a skill set as such. A teachable person. I'm looking for a teachable person, a disciplined person, person and a respectful person. And someone that loves animals. That's the number one anyway. That's non-negotiable. But it, the guy I've got working at the minute who was there for a year, been there for three years was a guy that worked at my house doing the garden, doing the windows. The guy never turned up late, never left early, smiled as he was doing things. I look out my window and think, this guy's fucking mental. I was like, me, why is he smiling? It's, the weather's terrible. He's doing everything and he's smiling, smiling. And he come in every day, did everything he needed to do. Went down, had a chat with him. He said, what do you really want to do in life? I said, I love dogs. I said, you're the fucking guy I need. He said, what do you mean? I said, you can apply the discipline and the happiness and the work ethic that you've applied here into dogs. You'll become a top trainer. You will become a successful trainer. You will become a very good person in the industry that we're in and you can make something special of your life. And three years later, he's fucking smashing it. He's doing good. He's progressing. Same with Fabio, who you met. Yeah. yeah Fabio is obsessed. He's obsessed with it. Yeah, he's, he's, good. he's good with the dogs too. He will be one of the best trainers in England in a very short space of time and even the world in not long. Mm. Why? Because he's disciplined and obsessed. Yeah. The guy drives every day, an hour and a half to work, an hour and a half back, never late, never leaves early, doesn't call in sick, and fucking works. And he's obsessed. Yeah. They're the team that I want. And they're the kind of people that deserve to go on a Miami trip. They, they, because, they've because, been around the world. These people have sat on private jets with us and sat around billionaires and the like, in the best hotels in the world, seeing the best things, eating the best food, around the best people. They come back and they're buzzing. The people who come back and dip the people who don't have any discipline or ambition that's fine they and, can go and it's for you it's for you as a boss as a mentor as a as a business owner to inspire and instill that in your staff so exactly. so if if you've got a high turnover of staff whether you've got a high turnover or a low turnover that's your fault either way either so, way, so, so it's course. all reflective of how you are as a, as a person definitely and look, i accept a lot of people go and people can't hack it but that's the price you pay when you have high standards that is the price you've got to accept. You do not go, oh, it's all right for now. It isn't. You can't. As, as soon as you feel like that, you get rid of them, don't you? You have to. 
I have to go, I have a certain standard and a certain person that has to be around us. Yeah. People change as well, don't get me wrong. People start off good. People start off good, but then six months down the line, all of a sudden the dip. Seven months down the line, the dip in mad eight months, they ain't got it in them. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, where yeah, discipline yeah, yeah. comes in. Yeah. Because you might do something good for six months. People can stick something out for six months, but seven months, eight months, it's raining, it's windy, it's cold. I'm not getting what I want out of it. I'm seeing nice reels, I'm seeing Instagram videos. Where am I? Why am I not doing it? I did yeah. that for 10 years. Yeah. Just to even start. To even see life. Yeah. To even get on a plane. They've done it for three months, six months to think they deserve to be on private jets living the dream. Like, I fucking grinded for 10 years for this. You lot have walked in at a, at a position where you've even got the ability to go see these things. Yeah. And even, and yeah, and even the facilities that you've got that they're working in are not, are not bad, are they? Let's be honest. Listen, I, <laughs> like, it's like Hollywood. It's like show Hollywood. Me, for show dogs. me another dog facility like these in England. Yeah, I've, yeah, spent, yeah. Fuck, I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of thousands just on here, just in this room alone yeah, yeah, around yeah. the outside of it. Yeah. Everything, it's an incredible place. Yeah. You know, it could be better. I look at everything, it could be better. Of course it can. But in terms of like, it's amazing. I mean, I just want to say to you, like, I think what you've achieved and the adversity you've had to go through to achieve it and to kind of get to the level where you can kind of somewhat, I think even yourself can somewhat look at this and go, do you know what? I'm a little bit proud of myself and what I've done. You get that sense of achievement. It's nice. You get yeah. it. You feel good. You, you feel nice about it. But I know that there's that part of in you that goes, oh, I want more, I want hey, more, there's I want a, more. There's a, there's and, that, and that never, and I just want to say to everyone who listens to this podcast, that's never going to go no matter what what. No, I, can't, what I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be saying without it. Look, it yeah. keeps the fire in me. Keeps yeah. my purpose. That's the thing. Like, you, you can, if you're happy, you're happy. Call it a day, you know, stay where you are. It's not me. Can't sit still. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I'm going to say to you on the podcast. Yeah. When, when we, when, when this smashes it, Yep. And we do part two. We'll do part two in like somewhere like Miami. We'll or, be doing part two in America because uh, we'll or, be in America yeah, very uh, soon. I reckon we'll do part two of this in America. Yeah. But I just, I just want to thank you for your time today coming on here and, and dropping your wisdom. And, and mate, I, I want to see you smash it on all levels, continue to do so. But I love to ask this question when we leave the podcast because sure. I think it summarizes it for the audience of what they can really crystallize and take away from this episode. But if there was like one piece, one golden nugget of advice that you could just leave this world today, but you couldn't leave the dogs or the training or the app or anything else, but you could just leave one piece of wisdom that cuts through all the noise of all the shit that's going on in everyone's head right now, yep. what would that be for you? I'd say f apply some discipline into your life and everything else will change. Just apply some discipline, small steps day by day and believe in yourself. Because I was a kid with nothing, with no education, I've had no help, and we've got to where we've got to now, and we're only scratching the surface. And I love I, it. I and love I'd it. always say and another thing, what you do here today, I appreciate you coming. You've come to do this on me, which gives me a nice feeling of, I've achieved something, because you're sat here with somebody, like, who wants to podcast me? But for you to see the value of what we've done is a nice feeling as well. I want to bring people podcasts that haven't been done before. Yeah. So look, I can reach out to all the Tony Robbins of the world and the Alex Hormozis and all these that, but they've been on lots and lots and lots of podcasts. Yeah. And although, yes, I'm going to have these people on at certain sure. periods of time and I am going to do them. I want to bring people that have took themselves out the trenches from nothing into something so that the audience can understand that anyone can do it and That's absolutely nice smash it. That's a good thing because you want good for people. That I've come from where I've come from, yeah. Like so, like, that gives people hope. But I, but I'm also what you're saying that you've done yeah. is what I'm in the pursuit of trying to do with my podcast. Yeah, I'm trying to build the best. Well, no, I am building yeah. the best education podcast in the world. Yeah, it's going to take me years probably because of just the nature of how it goes, and I haven't got the um the facilities that some other podcasters have got, so yeah. to speak. But you'll get but, there. But I'll get there, yeah. and I'll get there with relentless action towards putting out the content that's purposeful to me. Yeah. This being one of those episodes. Yeah. So I just want to say, mate, I really appreciate that's you. It's been an absolute Thanks pleasure. for having me Thank here. You. And guys, do me a solid favor, yeah? Subscribe to this on whatever platform you're listening to. I really, really need you to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. On YouTube alone, I've got 97% of the audience to watch week in, week out, and they haven't hit subscribe yet. If you could just hit subscribe, it means a lot to me. On Apple and Spotify, if you could drop us a review and all that stuff, that all helps too. Put this in as many people's ears as possible. I am actually trying to go around the world and add actionable value from podcasts in your ear week in, week out, and I don't think anyone else is doing it the way that I'm doing it. 
I hope you enjoy it. Much love. Guys, do me a solid favor. Drop a comment below this video and let us know who you want on the podcast next.